1995, we are interviewing Mr. Benjamin Fogel in New York City, New York, United States of America. Mr. Fogel, you mentioned that you had heard about what was going on in Germany and the rise of the Nazis to power. Uh, besides your brother trying to leave for the United States, did you feel that you wanted to leave or how did your family f feel about this danger in Germany? Well, of course, we, we did want to leave, but the possibilities were your, were Neil, I mean, uh, there was no possibility of leaving. And also, since uh, our f financial situation wasn't bad, and, and the really the truth is we didn't take this, those things serious. We didn't think that, the, that Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, it will ever materialize. So we just went along with the, with the fate that's going to be and life was going on uh, until, of course, uh, the war broke out when things, things changed. And what happened after the war broke out? Can you describe it, please? Well, the war broke out September the 1st. The Germans marched into our town uh, a week later. That was in the year? Uh, what year was it? It's in 39. Yes, it was in 1939. The, the war broke out in the first, and a week later, in September, they marched in. And of course, they, uh, the town, uh, half of the town, the marketplace, they burned just for the fun of it. And then it started right away. Uh, enacting a part of the part, I, I say, the Nuremberg laws by restrictions of movement, restrictions uh, of uh, leaving the city. Uh, they had to put on right away the armbands with the uh, white armbands with the mug and dovet on it. You couldn't walk without it. A yellow star? The we didn't have a yellow star. We had a, a Mogendovit with a white armband. Yeah. And the, the first thing they did, they, uh, they called together the, the Jewish council, the, the Gemene, which they were active before the war. And they gave them the same uh, powers, they taking over and they formed the Judenrat, the same people. And since my father was already before the war in the, in the Jewish council, so he was automatically included in that. And they uh, selected uh, one particular man, his name was uh, Mordechai Weizblum. He was a little outstanding. He spoke good German. They told him, you are the eldest of the Juden. You are the head of the, of the Judenrat. And you're going to take over the, the responsibilities of the country. So, uh, so it started out that the the first thing that was enacted really was you were not safe to go out on the street because the minute they occupied up, they uh, needed people to work for them. So they just at random went on the street and whoever walked on the street put them on a truck and took them to work. To uh, all kind of uh, dirty work, whatever they needed to do, washing, cleaning, all kind of things. So uh, sometimes people went away for a, a full day. They came back late at night. Their relatives didn't know where where the people went, and it went very scary. You hardly could see a person. People were afraid to go back out in the street. So the first thing uh, the president of the Union did. He uh, 
uh, had a meeting with them and told them, listen, this can go on like this. We are going to give you every day as many people as you want. But please don't catch people on the streets to go, go, to, go to work. So then they established that they called it Arbeitsamt, a place where people came in for work and they were assigned every day to go to certain places. And this was done that every, every, every Jewish citizen had to contribute to that. They had to give days of work. So whoever could afford, he hired somebody and they went to work for him. Somebody couldn't afford, he went himself. Then that, that was the time when my brother, the oldest brother, volunteered to work in that office. So he worked in that office for a few months and uh, w after a few months they decided that this, all the people, all the officers from that office will take over the militia, the Jewish militia. So my brother was included in that. So uh, in the beginning his job was to uh, uh, enforce the, the curfew because Jews couldn't walk after a certain hour and all kind of minor things. Then after uh, a while they wanted, I mean they made them put on hats, German, part of a German uniform, a hat. This my brother refused. He said he'll never put on a German hat and he's, he's not going to be part of the militia and he resigned and uh, he said whatever's going to happen with uh, all the Jews is going to happen to me, I'll just go with the faith. And so that's what we, uh, how we went along with that. How did the other militia members behave towards the Jews? Well, they had to do a job. The job sometimes wasn't a pleasant job to do. And that's what my that's why my brother has expe had expected that, and he didn't want to be part of it. Some behaved good, some overreacted. Is uh, the they were in a very bad position, and they and they uh, had to do it. The same thing is with the. Uh, with the uh, with the president uh, of the UNRAT, he was trying, but sometimes he had to do uh, work that uh, it wasn't pleasant for him to do. He did it. He. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, in 1940, a lot of people from outside came into our hometown, f especially from the area at the border with, uh, with Germany. They came from Konyan, they came from Poznan, they came from all the, from the border town where they, they were expelled by the Germans. So they came to our hometown. They came with nothing, whole families. Uh, we had to supply them with, uh, with food, with shelter. There weren't, er there weren't enough uh, apartments available. This was a job for the president to, to arrange that. And uh, we opened up a kitchen, a soup kitchen for the people. And the people uh, had something uh, to eat. And the, 
Uh, there were also a lot of uh, German Jews uh, came without, without nothing. And the president had to put a tax on the people who lived there before, who uh, uh, were known that they, they can afford, and everybody had to pay a tax to support that. And that's what was uh, going on. So the local population helped out all the refugees that came. Definitely. Huh? There were, there was were there any resentment or was there any there was disagreement? No there was no resentment at all. Everybody accepted. We accept our family from Konyan in, in our house. They stayed with us. Uh, there was also uh, uh, the sanitary conditions got very bad, and, uh, and typhoid developed in the town. So this had to be taken care of and helped. So uh, my father's job was part of the sanitation, and he was part of the bathhouse, because uh, they had, according to the Germans, the, the Jews had to go to uh, to the bathhouse have a, a certain uh, uh it's a public times, bath you know, public bath public bath it yeah. the same public bath was before the war we had it we had a mikveh we had this, the showers and we had uh, all that so my father was in charge of that and and i helped him out with that too so um and there was also starvation in Hungary, a lot of starvation, you know. By the, the people, way, the, yeah. the people who had some, uh, the people, the people who lived there before the war, and up, they had uh, a little more than the people who came from out of town. And, uh, so we helped them a lot. You mentioned that refugees came from Western Poland and from Germany. Where was Opatov located? Near what larger town? Opatov was located in central Poland, about 60 kilometers from Kielce. From Kielce, yes. From Kielce, yes. Okay. It was up was a main thoroughfare. Up, uh, Jews settled in Up in the 16th century by the invitation of a Polish King, uh, King Casimir. And Abt was one of the cities that they were allowed to, to settle there. And then build up a wonderful institution. Our synagogue was, uh, was built in 1636. The cemetery goes back to 1636. Yes. Tell me. When the Germans, after the Germans occupied the town, besides establishing certain rules and regulations, uh, did they establish a ghetto in that town? Well, we were lucky in that respect that uh, uh, until uh, beginning of 1940, they had such, it was all in, in writing, it was uh, signs of law where you shouldn't cross uh, this area and, and uh, you shouldn't go here, you shouldn't go there, but it was loose, it was loose, nobody really obeyed it. We, we did it on our own risk. We still dealt with Poles a little bit. Our store was still functioning in the same place where it was. So the situation for the, for the people who lived there before the war wasn't as bad as the people who came in, and they depended on us. We should help them, and they really helped, helped us all over. Yes. So there and were no formal walls around the ghetto. There were simply areas that you were not allowed officially to go to. Yes, there was. This was by 1941, Up established the real tight ghetto. We had to move our store. We had to move our store, and we had to go to, of course,
because we, our house was happened to be in the ghetto. So we were lucky in that respect. So we went, we did our, all our work in, in the ghetto. But there was no connection anymore with Poles. They put up uh, the uh, uh, certain gates and uh, barbed wire. It wasn't a barbed wire. It was a fence. Fence. It was fence. A few fences, and uh, it was very difficult for them to make it all tight because we were kind of mixed with the Polish population. So on one side was all tight, the other side was just signs all over. If you cross here, you're going to get shot. And some people took chances we were shot, some people took chances that uh, they, they, uh, they made it. So really in 41, where it started really to get bad. So then they uh, Around our area, run up, we had a few factories. There was Skarjusko, Kamienna, there was Starachowice, there was Piomki, there was Radom, there was uh, Sandomierz. They started to take people to those factories. In the beginning, they came to us, our town, to the Judenrat, they need so many, so many people. Well, of course, people try to stay away, to hide and so on. So the first time they took all the people who, who were registered in the kitchen soup and they sent them to Skarzysko, Starachowice, a few hundred people. A uh, few weeks later, they asked the same thing. They needed more people to go, young people. They surrounded the city, and they were going from door to door and just grabbed people. And took them to Skarzysko, Starachowice. We were the four brothers, my sister. We happened to hide in places they couldn't, they couldn't get us. So we uh, stayed around in the town. But the town started to become very, very tense. The air was very tense. When are they going to do it next? When, when they're going to need uh, more people? And uh, next time, a f another few weeks later, again, the same thing. There wasn't a family by that time that it wasn't touched that some members of the family weren't missing. Every family, people were missing. Our family was whole. Nobody was missing. We had uh, our children, the, my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law. We were all in town. So this time when they came, and it was unpleasant even to walk on the street for us to show that you did, you are still here. The whole family is here. Uh, my father, the family got together and said, you know, what are we going to do? People are all already separated, and we are the whole family. There's something that people, maybe people think it's, it's not right. Uh, he didn't suggest anything that we should do. He just brought up an idea, and I said, I am going to volunteer to go. They did not object. 
and they didn't say no, they, they didn't stop me either. And they gave me a few items to take along. And my father took me to the truck, he brought me two loaves of bread, and I said goodbye to them. And, and <coughs> that was the end of I, s I saw my father. So uh, we were as an assembled on a field and the outskirts of, of the town, a few hundred people. And the German masters each came and picked for his department people. One German passed me by and he looked at me and he said, Come, come, du bist rosa. It means, come, you, you look pink. And he had a special truck with his people. He took us to Skarnisko. Skarnisko? Yeah. Can you spell it, please? S-K-A-R-Z-Y-S-K-O. Kamyanma. K-I-A-M-N. And they took us to Skarjisko. There was a big building, a huge building. It took in a few thousand people there. And there were bunk beds, one on top of the other, four bunk beds with a little straw on it, men separate and women separate. I want you to know they took women too in that time. Uh, in the morning, we started out to, to work in the factory. The factory was an ammunition factory. They manufactured uh, for uh, uh, artillery shells. They manufactured for a light, uh, light mach machine uh, uh, bullets, or, uh, shells for uh, for uh, revolver shells, or, or it was all I mean ammunition. I was selected to work for uh, artillery shells, and. When I came into that department and people were there already a few months and I saw the red furnaces going to heat up the, the shells, I, I, I thought that this is hell, that I, I am dead. And this is hell. The people looked like uh, it's impossible to describe. There, there were no clothes. The clothes was all rags because they had no protection for the red hot shells they handled. And it, I thought, now this is the end. How can I survive that? Well, I was assigned to uh, work on the steel came in on a platform and I was doing welding. I never knew about welding, but I learned very fast and I started to, to work on that. It was winter, snow, cold. We were working outside day and night, 12 hours a day. Two weeks we worked during the day, and two weeks we worked at night. Our food was 
uh, in the morning we had uh, coffee lunch time we had a soup uh, we came back from work we had a slice of bread and another soup this was our diet now we were in camp uh, our ghetto was still our people were still in, in the ghetto two months while I was in camp and we uh, through bribing the German authorities our community sent us uh, some more uh, food they send us clothing and also communication. We communicate with them with a letter. And that was going on until the end of the ghetto. In what year? The end of the ghetto was in uh, October the 23rd, 19. 1942. So my communication with my home stopped. It stopped. Now the ghetto, I wasn't at the liquidation of the ghetto. I was in Skardisko. But I learned from people who survived they described to me the liquidation of the ghetto. The ghetto was surrounded in the middle of the night and they gave everybody notice to leave the homes in ghetto in a certain place in our hometown. People didn't have enough time to take anything with them, they, di they didn't allow to take anything along with them. S so, uh, of course, uh, people had to go to that place. People who didn't leave, invalids, who couldn't move, were shot right away in the, in the houses. And for my family, I don't know what happened. I, they, they too went uh, to that place. There was a selection there. The selection was they selected some healthy people, a few hundred people on one side, and the rest on the other side. And they also selected uh, some people, around 70 or 80 people, to remain in the ghetto to clean up the ghetto. Now, the, uh, we had no railroad station in our hometown. The, ne the nearest railroad station was 17 kilometers from, from, from our hometown, and the name of the railroad station was Yashitse. Uh, the march started out the 17 kilometers. Whoever couldn't walk was, was shot. Whoever, wherever he stopped walking, they stopped. They shot him. They tell me they collected about 300 bodies from our hometown to the railroad station. They were loaded on railroad station, on, on cattle cars, and they went on the way to Treblinka. Uh, 